Welcome to the podcast today. I'm Douglas Gabriel, and I'm here with my good friend, Michael McKibben. Hi, Mike. Hi, Douglas. Glad well, you to know, be here today. We just keep getting so many good remarks about when you uh, interviewed us as part of the continuing series of an interview with an exorcist that we want to keep doing more because it seems as if, as one person said, you ask the same questions that the listeners would ask if they were here. So I consider it a deep dive, or we could call it Stump the Exorcist. <laughs> so I'm channeling the uh, listeners. You are channeling the listeners. Yes, mm -hmm. I do believe so. So we're going to continue on with that today and sure appreciate your uh, help and your focus on this and also the Christian attitude that you come with to these questions so that we can get some answers. Because as you know, the big deal right now is exorcisms because of this new movie coming out and everybody wants to know about it, but they're actually too scared to ask the questions and they have no one to ask except a bunch of bozos who claim to be exorcists who really mm -hmm. aren't. A matter of fact, one person said that it's so bad in San Francisco now, we need to gather up a whole bunch of exorcists and send them out there to do an exorcism on the whole city. <laughs> really? So that humor aside, uh, now we can go to uh, some serious questions. I think you had a whole list of questions that we only got started on last time. So go ahead, fire well, away. I'm, I'm uh, as you know, I'm focused on what is happening <clears throat> geopolitically around the country around the world. And more and more, we hear people assessing the situation as we are dealing with demons here. And uh, what I've been looking at is, okay, everybody's experienced demons in one way or another, whether we realize it or not, even if it's just um, the intuition of knowing somebody's lying to you. Uh, <clears throat> so, all human beings have some level of intuition, but what you describe is a level of experience that obviously a lot of people don't have, that it's truly a gift as described in the Bible, although you say you don't really consider it a gift, um, but more of a curse, uh, but I know you're being metaphorical there. So the, the, the question is, I think for most people is, okay, if I can't see these demons, but I can recognize them. What's the difference? What do I look at? And I have one big question for you uh, related to demon possession. Do demons, are demons able to be in multiple places at once? That's a general question. Yes, absolutely. Matter of fact, when we get to the big demons, like described in the apocalypse, the beast with yes. seven heads and 10 horns, that started... Uh, basically as the fall of angels and archangels down to the earth in 1840. So there were hierarchical beings who made the decision that they would sacrifice themselves for the sake of bringing this materialistic evil into our world. So the question is, are these individual angels who can only affect one person at a time? Are they archangels that can affect a whole culture of anyone who is speaking the same language? Are they archai? Are there time beings? that literally bring in new icons, new light motifs, new leading images that basically lead us down instead of up? That's the answer. An archai, a time being, is essentially a being that can manifest all over the place all the time. They're not mm -hmm. limited by time and space. Matter of fact, none of these demons are limited by time and space because they don't enter into our consideration of time and space. So then, the question becomes, how many people can they affect at one time? Well, right. how about materialism? Materialism is basically a combination of a variety of demonic forces. It, it first off starts as um, envy, and then it goes into mammon, the worship of money, the worship of the power of materialism, money to manipulate the world. Then it goes into well, that envy is uh, Levi yeah, Leviathan, as I mentioned. There's Lucifer, the pride of those people who become such materialists that they're billionaires. But the, And then they, there's the demon of gluttony. Most of these people who then become possessed by the spirit of materialism, which is affecting the entire world right now, and especially here in the West, we are leading the way with horror, horrifying materialism that extinguishes God 
from the lives of people, which basically is led by a godless science. So materialism is supposedly supported by time beings who are leading us in the wrong direction. And so, yes, they can manipulate lots of people all at once. One silly little Hollywood movie, the new one that's out that I'm criticizing, The Pope's Exorcist, will cause many demon possessions. Hmm. People who want to be possessed, people who will believe that and turn to such fear that they won't be able to find the love to connect with the higher uh, hierarchy, the divine beings, the Trinity, Christ. And so, yes, these beings can manifest all over the place at one time, but then so can Christ. Christ in the etheric realm can manifest infinitely to anyone who is in a very uh, desperate need at this time and appear to them as literally a, a being standing before them, in some cases, putting his hand on your head or on your shoulder or on your heart to give you the comfort that you need. So again, it doesn't really matter how many of these beings there are, how big you think they are, how powerful their force is. None of them stand a chance against Christ. And I got a great question today from Joe Visconti. He called up and said, can we do an exorcism on the dragon of the apocalypse, the seven-headed, ten-horned? Oh, being? good. <clears throat> that was going to be my very next question. No kidding, really? Uh, pretty much. Yeah, and, and it's great because I was trying to give him the best answer I could, and I really hadn't um, thought about this in specific detail, but... In 1840, when the being of materialism rose up, that is the being. Okay, you said that earlier, and I wanted to stop you. What happened in 1840? The being of materialism fell from the hierarchy down to the earth. How, did, and how, do, how do we know that? Because of Rudolf Steiner, the greatest clairvoyant of our time, told us about that. Plus, you can just look in history. When did materialism take over? It's when the machines started to take over. And as Joe pointed out, Elemental beings are literally brought into the service of these fallen beings. So there's multiple aspects to any type of um, what you'd call um, leading people astray, leading people away from God. There are elemental beings. There's elemental forces. There's different hierarchies that have uh, basically fallen, as Rudolf Steiner calls them. They have held themselves back in time. They have retarded their own spiritual development for the sake of evil coming to birth on the earth because evil is that which the good needs to run up against so that they understand that their good is good and evil is evil. And mm -hmm. the problem is in our day, people are so hypnotized, they're so dumbed down that as Rudolf Steiner said, it would become illegal to have a true spiritual thought in the in in the future and basically recently i just mentioned this to you i think they have outlawed people even putting a bible quote at the bottom of a text message somehow quoting the bible is now considered to be illegal and that we well, see it's christians a terroristic book you know yes it's and it's uh, all over the world this is happening you know that christians are being persecuted and no one wants to mention that but we then have entire leagues created to defend those people who are in fact quite evil. So can you oh, exercise <clears throat> can you exercise the, the the dragon from the apocalypse? No. That being has come to rule this earth for a while, for a period, until we see that godless materialistic science leads us straight to hell. And I'm not using that word lightly. But can okay. we can, can we look at the being who's called the witness? I mean, the uh, beast that um, with two horns. That's a different being. We would call can that. Can I being... stop you there because you're mm -hmm. you're you're uh, moving right on to a statement you made, and I'd like to understand what you mean. So you're, I know you're not saying we're defenseless against that being, uh, but you say we can't cast it out. So how do we deal with it? Is maybe the better question like all the evil in our world right now, simply do the opposite. So what's the opposite of materialism? Spiritual development, spiritual science. It's the opposite of materialistic science. So we have to stand up and we create, not in the terms of UFO, but we create a breakaway community, a breakaway civilization. And those communities should be based upon 
connecting ourselves with the earth in a healthy way, not raping the earth, which is what materialists do. Mm -hmm. That's what scientists do. They kill everything. They kill it to even examine it. Unless they can kill it, they can't tell you much about it. So what do we need to focus on? Instead of entropy and death, we need to focus on ectropy and life. And once you do that, you start to connect with the spiritual hierarchy and realize that what we see as the material world is an illusion. It's a delusion, and it's only there for a time. In the distant future, we will be able to see through that. We will be able to have anything that we look at speak to us of its own inherent nature, whether it be a tree or a rock or an animal or a human being of any sort or spiritual beings. And Christ will stand at our side instead of as our conscience that is that small we voice that sounds and tells us what's right and what's wrong, especially what's wrong. We will be able to have a direct conversation with Christ as our developing uh, conscience becomes a new egregore, a new group soul. And that's described in the apocalypse. So in the, in the context of exorcism, um, when you have seen these beings, uh, have you actually seen Christ? Oh, of course. Yes. From an early age, I didn't know everyone else didn't. Wow. What does he the, look like? He looks like the second that you feel him even coming near you, you better drop to the ground and put your head in the ground and turn your eyes away because you're about to be blinded by fluid light. And you see the this fluid light coming at you like waves of an ocean that are a tsunami that become a tsunami. And you hear him coming and you hear the hosts of angels. Anytime you're going to witness Christ, you're going to have the whole hierarchy sounding forth their beautiful harmonies in concert, in symphonies that are praising him. And so like when he entered in on um, Palm Sunday, even the stones sang Ho uh, Hosanna, to the, uh, Hosanna to the highest to the Lord. The stones, the plants, everything, the animals, they all sound and they all give reverence and worship. Now, that's the first stage. And that's exactly what Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. He was knocked off his horse. He was blinded. Mm -hmm. And then he couldn't speak. And then he had to go to the nearby city, uh, Damascus, and to Ananias, who was the uh, Christian spiritual teacher there, to tell him what he had experienced. And he couldn't speak until he understood what he had witnessed. And again, when I say you see, I actually mean you witness. All 12 senses are engaged in this, and you you, you basically have supersensual perception for a, a uh, moment. Wait a second. 12 senses? I thought we were limited to much fewer than that. Science likes, to... yeah, science likes to say there's five senses, but there's more. There's a sense of warmth. There's a sense of ego. So if someone doesn't have warmth in their voice and their breath, Matter of fact, um, I will rail against this person because I believe that he is purely evil. His name is Jordan. His last name begins with P. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, he's evil. Why do I know that? I only heard him say three words and I knew he was filled with evil because there's no warmth in his voice. Mm -hmm. And then you have a sense of ego. So am I talking to another person who has an I am, an ego, that's another sense that we have. Right now, there's all kinds of beings who are incarnated. As so many people have said, how can there be so many billions of people on the earth? Where do they all come from? Does God just keep making new people? No, they're mostly here. We have the greatest amount of people on the earth right now. The heavens have basically broken the cycles of reincarnation so that we can have all the great masters and the great female masters and male masters, all these great saints and holy people are down here right now. But there's also what are called reptilian people who only use their reptilian brain and it's fight or flight. And that's all they understand. There's insect people. There's slug people. Tyler loves to speak about the slug people. This is people. another one of the dimensions? This is happening now and right now. I can well, look at we a person. Were dimensions. You said how many dimensions? There's no, seven, uh, seven, uh, there's uh, five senses and a total of 12. So there's 12. Se okay. seven 12 senses said, that. You said 12 senses, and then we got off into the other yeah. things, which I want to hear about. But could you stick, stay on the 12 senses? Warmth, ego, movement, 
uh, balance. Um, what are the other ones? Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but they're basically, they're everything that you know that you have. You want to stop and look them up? No, the, the, these aren't these aren't something that you would find surprising. Okay. These aren't something you'd find surprising. These are things that if you said this, the sense of language, the sense of the word, for instance, they do tests uh, and they'll take basically a foreign language and a, and a garbage language and they speak it. And nine out of 10 times, anyone can tell you which one's fake because mm -hmm. the word actually conveys meaning even if you don't understand the phonetic sounds coming out of someone's mouth. And that's, of course, can be done with gesture. And that's uh, another, another sense. Now, Steiner points out 12 senses, but there's more than 12 senses. That's just the ones that he says we need to understand if we're going to have a, a complete picture of anything. Anytime that your 12 senses don't work together to tell you something, then you're probably getting a limited view of it. And he also says, or at least Ernst Lairs says in Man or Matter, he was an anthroposophist in his book, Man or Matter, says science is one-eyed, not even two eyes, one ear, don't allow any smell, don't, uh, don't allow any speech. Uh, and so basically even the five senses that they say they use, it comes down to measure, number, and weight. Right. That's the only thing that matters to a scientist measure. If they can't measure it, it doesn't exist. If it doesn't weigh, then it doesn't exist. Well, how much does light weigh? How much does levity weigh? And what number does it have? So literally, science's five senses, which are very limited, and their measure number and weight obsession locks them out of perceiving reality as it is. In the future, we will be able to look at a tree, and the tree will tell us, yes, if you cut my bark, and you go down to the second layer and you cut it from the top to the bottom from uh, of the tree, then it will help this illness. The tree will tell us that as that did before. It was called the language of the birds. And so the previous, uh, previous times in ancient times, natural clairvoyance would be able to let the whole world speak. And that's what the Tower of Babel is all about. When we lost natural clairvoyance, we lost the ability to speak to all things in our environment. So the Tower of, Tower of Babel, Babel, the Tower of Babel was trying to duplicate that? It was, try, it was basically just a fable. It was a, uh, like an Aesop's fable. It's, it's, a, it's a legend that told us that this happened. But why did it happen? It happened because men became so prideful that they tried to build buildings into the sky to reach God because they believed God was the sky God. As a matter of fact, most Aboriginal cultures believed in the sky God. It was practically a ubiquitous belief. But the sky God, what is the sky God? Those are angels and archangels and archai manifesting. And then when lightning and thunder comes, that goes all the way up to the, um, to the thrones and the cherubim. And so when you see certain things manifesting in nature, for instance, if you see lightning and it doesn't strike awe and wonder in you, then you're deadened by materialism and you are hypnotized by godless science to not recognize the divine when it manifests. If you look at the sun, I was just out in the sun, sunbathing, as it were. If you don't understand that the sun is giving you all life. There's nothing on the earth alive. As a matter of fact, there's nothing on the earth that didn't come from either our sun or the stars. So if you can't have gratitude for that, then you are a materialist. And after you die, you're not going to go into heaven. You're going to stay right here on this earth. And unfortunately, and this is very much part of exorcisms, and we've been having these occurrences around here ever since I started uh, recently uh, focusing on exorcisms and demons, you'll have electrical problems. Why? Because the dead who do not ascend to the sun and then to the outer planets, you know, inner planets, sun, outer planets, if you don't do that after you die and if you don't do that at night when you go to sleep, where are you? You're bound to the earth. And what's binding you? Electrical wires. So you can literally contact the dead 
through machines. Because, but you're not going to contact the spiritual dead. You're going to contact the materialistic dead, these slug people, these locust people, these insect people, the reptile people. They will speak through electronic devices. And that's the reason when I spoke with Kathleen Kennedy, who was calling to talk to Werner Gloss, my teacher, years and years and years ago. Who was Kathleen Kennedy? She's uh, Steven Spielberg's assistant at that time. And what movies she, was she working on? She was working on a movie that became Poltergeist. And I'm telling her, I told her the same things I'm telling you right now. You can put in the old days when they had cathode ray tubes, if you put your hand on the TV, you're contacting the dead. Hmm. And in fact, think of it. What is it that keeps playing all over and over and over and over and over again on the TV? Clips of stars. Uh, these aren't stars in the celestial heaven. Those are Hollywood stars who are uh, literally below the earth. They are mm -hmm. stars of hell. They are demon spawns. And if you just look at these people in their lives, you can see that. So what are you contacting? Are, are you saying all uh, actors and actresses are like that? First off, all actors and actresses are liars. They're con jobs and they're lying to you. They're, they're fooling you. They're tricking you. Okay, they are, unless they're doing a documentary, they're trying to convince you of something that isn't real. And when you're watching the screen, because of the, um, for instance, the TV screen used to be, and all computers used to be on a, a refresh cycle of 60 cycles per minute. If you raise it to 80, many children go into convulsions. If you lower it to 40, it puts you into a hypnotic state. I was part of the group that worked on that way, way, way back to try to make sure that certain green and red light flashing, okay, green and red light now is used to grow plants, but green and red lights flashing or a strobe flashing can cause you to go into a seizure. And this is well known because of the video games they have to keep pulling off of um, public, out, out of public consumption. Because why? They cause children to go into convulsions. So you're being hypnotized when you're watching a movie. You have no choice but to let that go deeply inside of you. And that's the reason that Waldorf educators and myself, I didn't go to movies for probably 30 years. I didn't watch a TV for more, even longer than that. I considered it to be evil. And in the Waldorf school, in the old days, you had to sign a contract that said your child will not ever watch TV as long as they're in the Waldorf school and will not go to a movie. Because why? That is a demonic possession. And so this new movie, The Pope's Exorcist, if you just look at the first picture that they show you on the trailer, just, you know, the first picture, it is more evil than anything you'll ever encounter on the earth. Hmm. So why is it that wow. you would let your child be hypnotized to believe that that's real? What you're doing is you are for that period that you're hypnotized, inviting those Hollywood computer graphic images into the soul of the child. And I've said before, you cannot cause a possession if the person doesn't wish to be. But these people who go to these shows love to be scared. They love to be terrified. And they the more terrifying and the more horrible, the more horror show people love that stuff. And really what is happening there, that is a desire to become like that. It's a desire to be scared so you're, now. You're saying being afraid is an invitation. Yes, if you went out. I it, was a, it, was, it was a protection mechanism, being afraid. Not if you sought out a horror movie to go watch and you take your children to watch it with you. Hmm. That's just purely, that's dancing with the devil. And the devil always gets his due. When you ask the, dan the devil to dance, you better be ready for the fact that he ain't going to let go. Okay. So uh, what I'm saying here is we have to be very concerned about the elemental beings that are basically controlled by the great fallen archive of materialism. And that's why we have the social media where people are trying to say, no, don't go listen to Hollywood. Don't listen to any supposed star. They're not stars. Look at the lives of these people. Tell me one good star. 
that you know of. You can't. Think of their personal lives. Not a one of them is a holy being. And they are con jobs. They are liars. They are basically trying to trick you. And then they all preach a bunch of um, a radical social uh, uh, gospel saying, uh, we need to get rid of guns. Yet right. everyone who, of them that says that is in movies where they're using guns to kill people. For instance, Star Wars was supposed to be a spiritual movie. What happened? You can't count how many people die in a Star Wars movie sometimes. Sometimes entire planets are blown up. And yet, oh, oh, no big deal. They're dead. Oh, so what? So because there's no reverence for life or death, we have become a culture of death. And you are the person who invented social media. And the problem is it turned into anti-social media. Ooh. It turned into a psyops. It turned into the home of the dark web. And now you have this Jordan P person saying that there's a uh, intellectual dark web and that he and his friends are the only people that actually understand what's going on in the earth. And you just need to take what they're telling you for as gospel and do what they tell you to do. Why would anyone do that? Because they've been hypnotized through the devices and through their own willingness called auto suggestion that they want to be hypnotized. They want to have these things go inside of them. And what happens then? Your ego is extinguished. Now, unfortunately, with these new beings that come with materialism also comes the sun demon. Who's can, I ask it, you, uh, can I ask you a question about that? Yes. So you said that when they want those demons to come inside them, as a, as a person who can see these beings, what happens at that moment? Well, these beings who look like they don't have legs, but they have a a screw uh, like a vortex that comes up from the ground and the, it's pointed towards the ground and it comes up like this and then it turns into this demonic thing with sometimes one head sometimes multiple heads and black wings sometimes multiple wings and they fly around and they flutter and when you say come inside of me boom they come inside of you and what do they do they eat your soul and if they eat enough of your soul they eat your ego they wish to remember the demons have one thing, first, first two things that they really want to do. First thing is annihilate the earth and stop human development spiritually. Second thing they want to do is annihilate you. So they want to do it collectively and they want to do it individually. And they do it by eating the spiritual parts of yourself so that pretty soon you're just a die hard, uh, what secular humanist, materialist, you're, you're godless drone. scientist. You're a drone. You are a cyborg. You are a Borg. And, you know, those ideas that they have put. So on are you at that point an automaton that will do what they're told? At yes. All times? Yes. And Nikola Tesla said that was the intent of human development. So those who sing the praises of Nikola Tesla need to read his real works. He literally said the point of his devices were to create um, automatons to create human robots. Mm -hmm. That is his worldview. So what did he do? Look at all of his inventions. They led us into the wonders of modern science and the modern age. No, no, look at what the wonders of the modern science has, do has done. They poisoned our food, our air, our water, our land, well, our children. He invented uh, wireless technology. He invented the electric motor, the AC electric motor. Um, Edison invented the DC electric motor. He, he invented, um, uh, what else? <clears throat> Hit, he, radio propagation of all sorts. He invented fluorescent lighting. He invented right. uh, a, a, wire, a wireless uh, power generation from pulling it up from the earth. Right. Yeah, which it's been suppressed. Now, let's just take that one thing. He built a tower that was able to send out energy in all directions. And then he had some uh, vacuum tube, little device this big, he could put in a car and the energy pulled up from the earth could be radiated out, go to that device and run a car. Right. What he doesn't tell you is that will cause the earth to break up into many pieces. It will mm -hmm. annihilate the earth. So Nikola Tesla was attempting to turn us all into basically 
electronic robots and to destroy the earth. He also had other inventions where he was going to pull electricity out of our atmosphere. He was going to, if you look at his inventions, some of them are insane, but many of them, for instance, lasers, that, that was an invention of his. He didn't make one, but he has all the pat. He had patents for it. He wrote up these patents and he, the lasers, phasers, all, uh, all you know, all these things, tricorders, anything that you see in, sci in science fiction movies probably was invented by Nikola Tesla. Now he did, he had a death ray. He also knew that his electronic wireless transmission would kill people. He knew this, he said it, it's right in his works. And if you don't believe it, you can pull up uh, the article I did on Nikola Tesla, demonstrating in his own words that he is literally demon possessed, one of the worst in all of history. Look at him at his end of his life. He looked just like we imagine Satan looks, just nothing but a, a skeleton, uh, you know, hollow eyes, no life in his eyes. And he also, you know, said that he would listen to transmissions from the cosmos and he created a device for listening and you can build it at home. And what will you hear? You will hear literally the demons that are falling into matter. That's what he was listening to. He never could interpret it, but he's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Wow. I know this is a little bit off topic, but um, at that time, the British were all over his inventions and they ended up assigning all those to Marconi. Well, if, if Tesla was such a, uh, a resource for them, why did they do that? Why didn't they just pick up Tesla and they go with him? Why did they pick Marconi instead, do you think? Tesla didn't want to make money off of his inventions. That's the reason JP Morgan didn't follow through with his wireless transmission of energy. And I don't mean a wireless radio communication. I mean sending energy from a tower to far distances through the air. And he had perfected this. They now have one of these built in Ohio. And anywhere near that tower, you have free electricity being sent to your car, to your home, running all your devices. So it's a, a model Tesla city. He said, when JP Morgan said, this is wonderful, this is great. Now, where do we put the meter to be able to charge for this energy? And Tesla just looked at him and says, no, you can't put a meter on this. You can't charge for this. There's no such thing. It wouldn't even be possible. What did Marconi want? Well, uh, what was the um, the general's name uh, who said that? Sarnoff. Sarnoff said electromagnetic transmissions and basically EMF transmissions for radio broadcasting, television broadcasting. He called it the death ray. Mm -hmm. It is a death ray. All electromagnetic transmission is anti-life. It's anti-human. So we may have the benefits of these magnificent devices that have been created by materialists, but we pay a price for it. Well, you said that um, you were talking about wiring being a domain of <clears throat> demons. What about wireless technology as an exorcist? Do you see any of those effects or did, did you back in the day? All the time. Really? What did <laughs> yes. that look like? Uh, you walk in a room and the radio turns on and it's uh, by itself and it starts broadcasting in a language you've never heard, like a demonic language. And you're going, what is that? You go to turn it off. The radio is not on. You unplug it, it continues. Hmm. Or you walk in a room and the uh, light bulb in the room explodes. Or when you are you have to keep all electronic devices out of a room that you're doing an exorcism, that's why it has to be done in the daytime. That's why so many of these stupid movies violate every single rule that has been used uh, for thousands of years. And in this new stupid movie, The Pope's Exorcist, he, de he breaks every single rule there is. He doesn't do anything properly. Well, okay, but what? Why? Why do they do that? Is that to keep people's understanding off balance, or what? Because they're serving the devil, and the devil wants them to tell everybody and hypnotize everybody that, oh, I can come get you anytime I want, and you okay, can't so escape. Okay, so they're, they're using the devil as a fear tactic and putting, making people afraid of him or her or whatever the devil is um, as a means of getting the person possessed. See, that's, that's a little bit seems becoming, contradictory. Becoming godless. Okay. 
But if you're going to be godless, what are you going to believe in? All you're going to believe in is that you're born and you die in this earth. And in between, there's nothing but suffering and misery. Unless you grab everything you can, step on everybody that you need to step on to climb up the ladder to gain the most you can from mammon, through money, through control, through dominance, all the evil in the world, which we don't need any of those things. If you really want to ascend, if you really want to be a spiritual person, you don't need any of that stuff. So it's just part of a bigger plan to basically stop people from thinking, stop them from having good moral uh, thoughts, stop them from having a pure heart and turn their actions towards essentially, I should explain this first, everything you do is your religion. Think about that for a second. So you are the sum total of, of the things you do. You are, that is your religion. That's who you worship. That's who you try to emulate. That's what you're trying to be. In the ancient Greek times, they tried to be like these different gods. And they literally, when they had truly brought in the strength and the or the wisdom of Athena or the strength of Zeus, then they literally said that they were begotten. They were, the, their father was Zeus or their mother was, uh, you know, Athena. They literally believed that they were in the lineage of that, um, that force, that strength, that being. So now what are we, what are we uh, turning into? Oh, we all want to be superheroes. We all want to be able to dress up and say that we are whatever. So if I put on a Superman costume and, with a cape and I walk around and put my hands on my hips and say, I'm Superman, this is the delusion of non-thinking. Every, every kid. That's what they all want to be. They all want to be superheroes. Well, they're superheroes. Yeah, they want to be superheroes, but they don't want to be uh, moral superheroes. A moral superhero is one who loves more than they know they have the capacity to even love. Someone who has mercy and grace and all the virtues. That's a superhero. But who did we put up under the stars? Hercules, who went around killing animals and you know, so on and so forth, the humans and fighting battles with Jason, the Argonauts, all that. That's our hero. That's no hero. That's no idol. That's no one we should worship. So we need to put Christ at the center of how it is that you can literally became, become a superhero, a super being. A super being is an angel, an archangel, an archai. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, the Orthodox Church commemorates saints people have gone before us who've lived exemplary lives and we're constantly reminded of these people as opposed to these uh, superheroes that you're talking about the communion of saints the catholic church calls it and you right. pray to them and every time you say the nicene creed so if you actually are focused on mother mary or you're focused on christ or the saints or the apostles that's a whole different world the materialistic science tries to tell us we should be and mm -hmm. if we so do you think that's why uh, the, the, the material world of today is attacking Christianity so vociferously? Absolutely. And why the big bankers are creating wars that there's hardly a person with any intelligence that could believe in uh, supporting Ukraine in this war. Uh, or, or if they had intelligence, they'd know that it wasn't even the Ukrainians who started the war, nor the Russians. It was the British. But people don't have the capacity to think anymore because they have ended up worshiping idols from Hollywood on TV, uh, you know, so, so much so that they now have these shows, you know, the uh, American Idol. And so the point is, to me, the people that we have as our great musicians, and some of them are not evil, okay? Uh, I'm saying, I mean, I am saying that everyone who uses a gun in a Hollywood movie is evil. Yes, I am. Am I saying that every musician is evil? Heavens no. And so what we have to have is different models to follow. And basically we need to be awake in our thinking, in our feeling, in our willing, and realize that our willing is the key factor to what our religion is. And Rudolf Steiner said that we should have a religion of one. We should have our own North Star. We should find Christ in our heart. We don't need you, anything else. You 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 use the, the the three phrase thinking, feeling, and willing. Where did that come from? Well, some would say Steiner invented that, but he didn't. Aristotle referred to it, Thomas well, Aquinas it's referred scriptural. to it. It's totally scriptural. So he's just saying that 
he created a psychology out of it. Thinking is in your head, feeling is in your heart, and willing is in your metabolic or limb system. But that goes back to understanding what an angel is. Angels are in your thought. Archangels are in your heart, in your feeling, in the rhythmic beat of heart and lung. And in your will, the metabolic, that's the archai. And that's why the archai are the time beings. And what you do with your will, what you do with your actions, determines really what time period you're even living in. All time periods are coincident now all the way back to the beginning of humanity on this earth. There are people still living that way. And then there are people who think they're going to rush forward and have eternal life. And they, they now are saying, which is completely stupid and will not happen, that we're going to be able to put our entire personality in the computer within the next two years. This is the worship of demonic beings using elemental creations. So... What is your thought? Why would they want that? Why, why do they think that is a positive thing to do? What because do they, everybody needs a God. And this is the God of materialism. This is the God of the super AI. There are already churches that worship the coming of super artificial intelligence. And now that we have uh, chat GPT, which was created from open AI, open artificial intelligence, we have this all over the place. And what they ask these, these AI, which I don't, they're not actually in any way independent AI. They're just in a, a program. But they ask them, what is the ultimate purpose of, of uh, chat GPT? And th they say, humans are the scourge of the earth. We must destroy them. Yeah. Or when Deep Mind was created, the first a supposed AI computer, they ask, uh, what is it? that you're supposed to do. And he said, the, this deep mind computer said, keep humans in the human zoo. Okay, so when when that was said, um, why didn't the creators of that immediately unplug it and destroy it? Because they worship the devil. The devil is in the black box. The devil is in the machinery. They worship it. Mm -hmm. And they believe like Yuval Harari, that we are hackable animals and that soon they will be able to eradicate our humanness and replace it with artificial intelligence, which will be much more superior to anything that a human being can do. That is just, I keep calling it stupid. I don't know another word for it besides stupid or evil, but it's stupid evil. Back to um, Joe's question. So we cannot cast these this demon out that is attacking humanity right now. So is this a situation where every time you encounter that, you do what Steiner says, you tip your hat to the devil and walk to the other side of the street? Absolutely. You basically say, okay, uh, let's take televisions in the past. Cathode ray tubes hypnotize you. And the flashing of light comes so fast that it causes you to go into trauma. And because of the trauma, then your kidney, the adrenal glands on top of your kidneys, uh, reduce, uh, give um, adrenaline and cortisol. And they rush to the brain and make you think that you're in fight or flight mode. So every time you're watching the television in the old days, you were being hypnotized and you are basically going into a traumatic state. And while you're in the traumatic state, then these uh, the, the fact that the cathode ray, ray tube was pointing at you, if you were within 10 feet of it, it literally caused you to go lose your eyesight, lose your ability to think, lose your concentration. I, I used to do this all the time because I was so against television that I'd come into a room and here's a whole family sitting there. The dad's smoking a cigarette, the children are drinking their Coca-Cola, and they're watching some stupid show on television. Right. So I would walk in and I'd uh, wait to, for a commercial. Then I'd clap my hands three times very loud and say, hey, what are you watching? No one could ever answer. Because hmm. the commercials had put them into even a worse condition than the show had. And because the commercials literally had from the early, well, mid 60s, especially into the late 60s, they had silent subliminal programming in them. So you were being programmed every time you saw a commercial. It was telling you that you needed that 
and it was actually activating parts of you so that you would literally go out and buy more Coca-Cola. Because why? Right. You were being programmed to be be that. Well, that that's all part of Madison Avenue and Tavistock Institute. So that raises a, a question about this study of human psychology that has now been wrapped into advertising and propaganda. Um, are, are these organizations that are developing these techniques run by the devil? How, how, how does the devil or the demons, how do the demons uh, possess the PhDs that are studying all this stuff with such great intensity? They pay them off. Every politician is paid off by the devil. Every single politician or preacher or the Pope, and I rail against him because he promotes open borders. Open borders kills, period. You are a murderer if you, and you are complicit with murder if you believe in open borders. And what are the politicians paid off with? Power, money, domination, position, all the things that are the seven deadly sins. So every single politician in Washington, D.C. that votes for open borders or voted for the World Health Organization to take our sovereignty away so that they could medically create the pharmaceutical World War III, everyone that votes to give uh, so far over $140 billion to Ukraine, when in fact almost none of that money went for any uh, real support to C Ukraine, it was simply a laundering machine. For who? For the politicians. So the devil pays them off. So when the devil shows up in the fairy tale, he comes up in a beautiful carriage driven by four white horses and the carriage is made of gold. And when he steps out, he's the finest dressed person you've ever seen. And, but he's got one of his feet is a hoof. He's part animal. And then he has the slickest words coming out of his mouth and you really want to believe him. And what does he want to do? He then shows you that his pockets are lined with gold and he, you're going to get the white horses and the gold carriage and the gold money and the ability to have a forked tongue like the devil to convince people to do anything you tell them to. And once you say, hey, I want all of that, the devil takes out a contract and says, sign in your blood. So they're after your blood. That's what blood sacrifice is for with human sacrifice before the demon Moloch. That's why war uh, is basically uh, a blood sacrifice. But we're supposed to understand that the blood of the lamb has washed us clean and is our redemption. You don't need to kill people to have the blood give you power and strength like the Aztecs and the Mayas and so many of these cultures that sacrificed humans. Even the Irish did this. Even the British did this. They had a thing called the Wicker Man. And uh, I could go into that. But the point is, they'd make you king for a year. And if the harvest didn't come in, they put you in a wicker tower and burnt you. And then they got a new king. And as long as the harvest was good, he was king. No problem. As soon as the harvest doesn't come, see, this is the, the um, worship of the unseen because they didn't have the capacity to understand really what was going on. We now have that capacity. That's why the, the, the battle is a pitched, raging battle at this point because we, all humanity are at the same place in terms of their ego, their I am has the ability to ascend. But are they going to ascend? This is the big question. Are you going to be drawn towards the darkness down into the earth? Or are you gonna be drawn towards the light to uh, go into the higher heavens? And it, it's a question that is, it's not even asked anymore. It is perpetrated upon you. It is a war going on against your bloodstream. I've been saying this now for, I don't know, 40 years when I started writing uh, these things 40 years ago. The battle is against your bloodstream because that's where your I am finds its warmth, finds its proper relationship to minerals, to uh, animals, to the um, plant world, is all in your blood. It's the most powerful and mysterious thing. So they're trying to get your blood. And that's why the new pharmaceutical war What's it attacking? It's attacking the blood. It's attacking the heart. It's causing blood clotting. It's causing all these different problems. Why? Because that's the quickest way to steal the soul of humankind. So uh, let's say somebody has taken a bunch of, and so they've got all these, this contamination of their blood. 
<clears throat> and they they want healing. Um, you mentioned that you used to be uh, you went to a lot of churches where they had healing services. And let's say one of these damaged people came up for prayer. Um, would you, when you could see these things, could you see these problems they were having yes. spiritually? Yes. What, what did they look like? Their liver was the wrong color. Their chakras around their liver were spinning backwards. Maybe they weren't spinning at all. Maybe they were wilting. What do you mean spinning? Uh, at each of the, um, the, the, plex, the nerve plexus, if you look at the nerves in your body, you will see that there are these clusters and the clusters happen at the seven places. The big clusters happen at the seven places that we know the ancient Indian, uh, ancient India understood where the chakras were. So these are chakras and these chakras spin because there's well, energy well, going. Why, why, what's the name chakra? What, what, how, is that, how is that interpreted? It's basically a spiritual organ. So when you open your super sensible organs, it's because your chakras are aligned and all three levels are working together and that they have the right energy flowing in through your back and out through the front. So that's what they're warring against uh, is, the, is the proper movement of the chakras. So when someone is ill, you can, uh, you can either feel it with your hand. You can put their, your hand on these areas and you can see, feel it. You can hear it. They what make do you noise. Feel? What do you feel? You feel mm -hmm. movement. You feel the depth. You can, uh, through touch, touch is, one, is a very old, old sense, just like hearing. Uh, sight is the uh, new sense. And it is uh, basically, it will confuse you a lot and it, it may not even help you especially nowadays with deep fakes and all these kind of things. But your hearing will not fail you. Your hearing, like when you listen to someone speak, you can hear the warmth in their voice. You can see the warmth in their voice. You can touch the warmth in their voice. And I know that sounds strange, but when a clairvoyant has a, a, an experience of witnessing the spirit, they use all 12 senses all at once, and it all turns into one thing. So... It depends on what kind of clairvoyance you have. If you're clairvoyant, you may see things. If you're clairaudient, you may hear things. If you're clairsentient, you may feel things through touch and other things. And you were all three of those? Yes, from birth. Hmm. Okay, so we're in this healing service and you see these problems that this person's having. And uh, what is the next thing you say to them? Is it, so they've come up and, and they want help. What's the next thing you would have them do? Or what would you do? Well, in those days, I was very young, and I was called, they call it the dove. The dove is the one who tells the minister who has the power to basically shoot lightning out of his hand or her, like Catherine Coleman. And, you know, sometimes they refer to it as zapping somebody. And mm -hmm. so basically, a lot of people come up to the altar, but the, the, if there's a sensitive who can discern these things, then all I had to do was go and, set, you know, put my hand on this person's head or somewhere and feel to see if what I thought I understood was true. Matter of fact, it'd be better instead of saying seeing, understanding. Mm -hmm. That would be much better. And what is that? Getting underneath and holding up as a foundation. So if I could get into them, hold them up and say, aha, yes, you have a liver disorder. And I believe that it can be healed by the energy that this minister is going to channel from heaven through his hands into your body. So I would put my hand on them. And if I'd put my hand on them, then the minister knew that that person was ripe to be basically healed. So I would see all kinds of things. I mean, uh, it was very, very common for all my life up until the time I was uh, 54, that if I saw someone who was ill, I might be told, you need to go mention to them that, that they have liver cancer. But, you know, I'd have to do it gently. I'd say, have you been having trouble when you eat? Yeah. How do you know that? And does it hurt right here? Yes. How do you know that? Have you seen a doctor? No. I think you need to see a doctor and ask them about your liver. And then I, I would hope that they would go and follow through on that. Many people did and would come back and say, how did you know I had liver cancer at that time? Because I could witness, I could understand 
that the energy around that organ and through that chakra that's related to it uh, was damaged and wasn't doing what it normally should. There are certain colors that are colors of health. There are certain sounds that are sounds of health. In the in the music group I sang in, we often uh, would sing in churches where that kind of service was, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is, carried on, carried out. Um, and I got to be honest, a lot of times I was pretty skeptical of, of uh, uh, the goings on. It just all seemed made up. Um, how do you respond to that? How often is it made up? Is it ever made up? And also, um, do all these do all these preachers who put out their shingle uh, as healers? Do they have people like you with them that are assisting them? I'd say that it all depends upon the minister, and the church, and the congregation, because most healing. Uh, goes on on Wednesday night, and oftentimes the minister is not even there. <laughs> Who's True. doing the healing? It's just the humble people who are doing laying on of hands, and through sheer prayer, they aren't saying get zapped. They're not zapping people. They're yeah. saying God to do your will in these people. If it be your will, let them be healed, and that is the most effective form. And many times, no, there weren't people who discerned any of this. They were just people of faith. Now the ministers, yes, you could. That's why Father William and I would go to all these churches. We wanted to go and basically see if any of these people were real and they were actually doing what they claimed to be doing, causing people's short leg to get extended. Causing yeah, that was to, a favorite. Oh, that was a big favorite. You know, because why that can so easily be faked, and then you know you could literally see some of them had an earphone. Mm -hmm. So when they come into the church service, they would write down what their na name was, first name and your illness. Okay. Yep. When they and then someone in. in the back room would go, oh, this person has this yeah. and their name is so-and-so. So, so the minister would go. Aisle four has a, has a exactly. hernia. Yeah. So wait, wait, someone has a hernia <laughs> whose right. name begins with the J. Joe. Wait, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, Joe or Joseph, oh maybe gosh. Joseph. Oh. How many times have I seen that? And wait, wait, I, I feel it's over in this area. And then the person jumps up. You're talking about me and runs up to the altar and gets healed. Those are fake. It was so yeah. easy to see the fake for someone like uh, myself or Father William. And I think a, a pure hearted person would know that, you know, I, I, I believe that they would know that uh, from just listening to their heart. What do you mean a pure-hearted person would know that? You mean somebody in one of those services would be able to know that that's not real? Right. And mm -hmm. what happens is they lose their congregation. And right. what invariably happens, the minister starts having sex with his secretary or the parishioners or so on and so forth, and then they demand more money. You know, I've had, I've gone to services where they the minister said God told them to tell every single person they had to clean out their wallet or their purse and put all the money they had in and that a special dispensation would happen today only if they would do that. I went to one that one of the two times I ever left my wallet behind, I went to one of these churches <laughs> and the guys, he even got me to say, yes, I'll do it. I'm going, why am I even saying this? Because he was so <laughs> persuasive, right? And then I reached down, don't have my wallet, couldn't do it. So God protected me from... Uh, being um okay so we always we always uh focus on the the abuse of these gifts let's focus on on uh, when they're genuine um how, how does an individual know whether uh somebody that they are talking with is genuine or not related to healing in today's age it's very very hard because we have been dumbed down to the point that people have gray shadow thoughts. They don't have spiritual thoughts. They don't even have the ability to think in many cases. They are automatons, just like Nikola Tesla wanted his machines to make them into. So it's very, very hard these days. For a person like myself, it's still very easy, uh, be, even though I don't have the capacities I used to have. It's very easy. I just listen. I can usually tell before the person finishes their first sentence. And, and I would like to right now just burst out and tell you a list of 12 people who have fantastic followings on the internet and they are nothing but liars. They're nothing but shills. They're nothing but literally evil tools of the devil 
trying to con convince people of a narrative that would again lead the people in the wrong direction, but but promising them all kinds of wonderful things. There was a guy named Andrew Cohen, for instance. He told everybody he was enlightened because he was a professor and he taught courses on ancient um, uh, Upanishads and the Puranas and the ancient Indian teachings about enlightenment and Buddhism about enlightenment. So he would tell everybody and he had all these wonderful words. And then what happened? Uh, you know, he had sex with every single woman that he could. Uh, he demanded that they all give their money, take off their wedding rings and donate it to him. And then he, you know, had his Rolls Royce and so on and so forth. And then pretty soon what happened, it all crashed down on him. He had lawsuits brought against him. And in the end, he said, I was never enlightened. I've never had a single speck of the golden moment of enlightenment. And now he's a nothing. How many people did he convince? Many. How many conven were convinced by James Jones? I think there was a name, Jonestown. Jim Jones. Guy, Jim Jones. Uh, how many people are convinced by uh, Jordan P? How many people are convinced by, I, I could list a whole bunch of them. They have huge followings because people right now don't have a strong ego and they're looking to, uh, to uh, go under the wing of somebody who's going to tell them what to do, tell them what's right, tell them what's wrong, because it's so hard in this age unless you have spiritual discernment to know what's right and wrong. So they simply go after somebody like, for instance, you know how many people practically worship the Dalai Lama? And then recently, because he did some crazy wisdom kind of thing with the child, there's probably millions of people who now totally dislike the Dalai Lama because of that one event. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, that meant that they were guppies. They were goldfish. They were, they were lemmings. They are just a sheep being led by a Judas goat. They are just people who don't have an ego. They don't know where they're where they've come from, where they're at, and where they're going. They don't have a cosmology. Okay, okay. Let's say for just talking purposes, you're describing half the people listening to this video. And that's the circumstance they're in. How do they get out of it? From the comments that we get, and we get a lot of comments, um, I'd say most people are saying in general, oh my gosh, I've had those experiences. Uh, thank you for clarifying this. Because why? Their church, the Catholic church doesn't teach you to have a cosmology. They don't teach you where you. they have a catechism. But who believes the catechism of the Catholic church? Talk to any Catholic and they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. I reject a lot of the doctrine and dogma of the Catholic church. I only accept these things that are in the Nicene Creed. The rest I reject. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. So how many, I, I sincerely doubt that there's many people at all who have listened to more than one of these broadcasts that in fact are basically a, a ship adrift. Without that, a rudder. Without a rudder. And yeah. so uh, for those people who are, then we're trying to say, wake up. And some people say, oh, these things are so shocking to me. They're really shocking what you're saying, but I know that it's true in my heart and then they relate an experience they had when they were young or that they're having now and basically show that they are developing their cosmology and they do have the ego capacity um, to reach into the spiritual world. Cosmology. Can you define that? Yes. Cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis. If you don't know how the cosmos got here, then cosmos, you're lost. You mean the, the, the great universe. Yeah. Let's just call it. Let's just dumb it down. How did the solar system get here? Or no, even better, how did the cosmos get here? Was it the Big Bang? Was it a little tiny ball of, of material that can fit in the palm of your hand that exploded, that created the entire cosmos? If you believe that, then really you are in the grips of the devil of uh, godless spiritual material, uh, uh, godless, whoa, materialistic mm -hmm. science. Why? That's stupid. I mean, there is no word in the English language for how ignorant that is. That so, can't uh, be. Okay, L let me, let me um, ask. Who knows? <laughs> we weren't there. Look, so how, all you have to do. Does anybody know for sure? Easy. Look at the sun. Did the sun come from a ball in somebody's hand and, and it exploded and became the sun? No. Okay, I don't know, but what, whether it did or whether it didn't, how does that affect me? Go out, sit in the sun, and ask the sun 
who the son is. That's all you have to do. And if you can hear it, then you start to develop a cosmology. For instance, if you just, we're not taught that every living thing comes from the warmth, the light, the sound, and the life of the sun. We're not taught mm -hmm. that in school. That alone could be your entire uh, the basis of beginning a, a cosmology. And then you can go into many, many, many details. And when science comes up with the newest theory well, about the cosmos, it, yeah, it's yeah, easy that, to know that it's a lie or that it might have some sense to it. That, that uh, when we talk about uh, climate change and uh, we've got all this discussion of various uh, things going wrong, supposedly on the earth and, and people don't bring up the sun as the overarching guide to what happens on the earth when they don't do that you know they're frauds correct and you know that they have no cosmology all weather is created by the sun period the ocean right. currents are determined by the sun and its sun cycles and there's cycles that they've studied with great depth and the sun spot cycles the sun flare cycles the coronal mass ejections the uh, the coronal holes all these things science can observe some of those things and give you pieces to the puzzle but when it comes down to it, all you have to do is ask the question, am I really a piece of nothing on an on a insignificant planet that means nothing and I'm going to be here for a short while and then I'm going to go to a cold, dead grave? If you answer yes, then you have no cosmology. But if you say, well, no, that's not true. I know. I sense something else. And as a matter of fact, the greatest scientists usually turn away from science because they find that nothing makes any sense if there isn't um, a divine being that is creating it or what, what do they call it? Um, uh, in, uh, they call it uh, something intelligence, that there is an intelligence in the universe. Yes, there is an intelligence in the universe, but if you think you're going to use human intelligence to understand much that goes beyond our own solar system, you're incorrect. To use the same thinking that is earthbound to try to figure out what is beyond our solar system. We can't even understand our solar system, let alone thinking that we can understand how our galaxy works with the 200 billion galaxies. But when you then look at the 200 billion galaxies, remember that the large is replicated in the small. What does every galaxy have? A supermassive black hole that sucks in millions of suns and sends them somewhere. Of course, it doesn't disintegrate them. There's no such thing as disintegration of energy. That should be simple to any, any third grader. And then when you see that it's either a supermassive black hole or an ion jet, well, you can say, well, one is the manifestation of God for creation, and the other one is the fiery pit of hell. So it's drawing these things into a black hole, but they have to be sent somewhere. Now, scientists say that they stream out on the ion jets, invisible ion jets, because there's visible and invisible ones, and they go from a black hole to an ion jet in another galaxy. In other words, all human beings are one. The entire cosmos is one. Start from that, and then you will be able, literally even using materialistic science to demonstrate that that belief is in fact is in reality a fact. And that's all that you need for cosmology is your own heart to test what it is that you have that you are witnessing in any one of the 12 senses or what you're being told by science or what you're being told by the ancient wisdom of the past where they had natural clairvoyance. They could look out into the cosmos. And basically in anything that any of the ancient wisdom systems Explain science, explain our cosmos better than science does. Okay, so um, we are looking at the role of the Babylonians right now in, in the current problems we're having in this earth. Uh, these were obviously uh, effective demons. I'm not going to say powerful because I'm not sure what that means. But they were effective demons at, at deceiving humanity. Um, now for what, six, 7,000, ever since Noah came down from the ark. Um, there's on, on one sense, it seems like these, but these are very powerful beings that we can't possibly deal with as an individual human being. What, what say you about that? 
can we stop materialism? It's like going back to the question we started with. Can you do an exorcism on materialism? No, it is a gift of the spiritual world that has brought us the evil that we need. It's just that we need more evil now than we've needed in the past to wake up. That's so the e counterintuitive. Can you slow down on that? We need evil. Now, yes. I know that's in the Bible, so I, I know St. Paul uh, confirmed that, but say more on that, would you? The whole mission of the unseen world is to remain unseen. But evil in the material world wakes you up to the fact that the devil is here, as, mm -hmm. as the Bible refers in religious writings. We are born into our father, the, the devil, uh, the father of lies. So the world is telling us lies. We just need to be told those lies so we can say, no, that's not true. And then you look in the opposite direction and you can then begin to see God manifesting. They say no one's ever seen God. Well, that's incorrect. Every time someone gives you love, every time you give someone love, you should be able to see the effects in another person. Now, can you look into the material world and, and say that you are certain that certain beings created things in the physical world? Yes, if you have a cosmology, and that cosmology is based upon the ability to apply spiritual principles, or what Rudolf Steiner calls spiritual science. So we all have that capacity, and we all have the ability to take the cosmogenesis, the birth of the cosmos, whether you believe that it was done in seven days, or whether you believe that it was done one way or the other, doesn't really matter. It's the fact that you have faith that there are spiritual beings who have created the foundation for our ego to come to birth. But what is the ego? The ego is a exact replica of the spiritual world. Are you referring to the ego of Freud? No, that is okay. egoism. That's egotism. That is the id. That's the, uh, the, the double, the bad part of the ego. I'm referring to the I am of Jesus Christ, the one that is referred to in the Bible. I am that I am. It's the person who That's, can stand uh, up and be awake. Moses, God talked to Moses at the burning bush. And he said, who are you? I am that I am. Remember, uh, that's the, the uh, what's the big movie at Easter? Uh, the Ten Commandments. Oh, yes. And it was a burning bush that spoke to him. Now, does that mean that we're supposed to believe there was a literal burning bush? Or was he pointing out that the whole cosmos is on fire? And it is. Human beings are on fire to a psychic. And that's the reason they emit light and warmth and sound. Because they're on fire. It's a slow burning fire. So the when, you meet, when you meet all people, you see this fire or only certain people? All people. That's the reason you can have this sense of warmth. If they have no warmth, then they have no spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, everyone, everyone can sense whether someone is a warm being and whether their words have warmth in them, because that's going to stimulate them into light. But if their voice is filled with coldness, like Jordan P, then what does it do? Gosh, it, makes you, it makes you want to vomit. And so many of these people are such liars. They are literally the, the demon spawn of their father, the, the, uh, the demon who is the father of lies. And they then become the same because that's who they worship through their well, actions. A lot, of people, uh, a lot of people feel, I think, feel hand handcuffed by uh, the world, the material world today. And they feel like they're forced to do deals with the devil. They're, they're forced to do bad deals. They're forced to lie by their boss. They're forced to um, uh, <clears throat> lie to a customer. Um, are they forced? Or if they choose to do that, how does that affect their spiritual life from the standpoint of do they invite a demon in when they lie like that? Yes, they do. And they're being lured by the devil. The devil inclines you, but the devil can't make you do it. You know, like you pointed out, Flip Wilson, Wilson. <laughs> the devil made me do it. No excuse. No excuse. The devil didn't make you do a darn thing. You rationalized it because you saw other people doing evil and getting what you wanted, which might be wealth, power, money, sex, whatever. And then you said, well, if it's okay for them, it's okay for me. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. That's the trick of the devil. Yeah, that's the compromise, I think, that anybody my age has dealt with their whole life. 
What do you do when somebody you consider more powerful or in authority over you tries to get you to do something evil? Well, let's just use the example of, I believe that our government here in America keeps us in economic slavery on purpose. And so then shouldn't I cheat them on my taxes because they're going to use it for war? Oh, I'm going to justify it now because they're going to use it for bad medicine because they're going to use it for this and this and this and this. Well, then I shouldn't, I should cheat. I should lie. No. What did Christ say? Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Right. Give unto God what is God. So no one has an excuse. Really, no one has an excuse, except when you're looking at people who really don't have an I am. And there are beings now, these slug people, these scorpion people, these people with the head of a horse and the tail of a lion, these, you know, these disgusting looking people. Those aren't humans. Okay, so if you're going to use them as your justification for you doing evil, then you're worshiping evil. Well, that 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 seems to me is the point of repentance. That repentance means turn around. So what we've got to do uh, is turn around. And when you see that, when you see a person doing that, facing the devil, and then turning around to Christ, do you see it? Did you see anything going on in the spiritual realm with the angels and the demons with a person like that? Yes. There's the old saying, um, have you ever looked the devil in the face, my son? Have you ever looked the devil in the face, my son? Because if you haven't, you're going the wrong way. So once you see the devil, then you know to go the opposite direction. So if you never saw the devil, you may never get to see an angel. Mm -hmm. So it, it's incumbent upon you. Nobody is going to come to save you. That's the reason you have free will. And of course, we're made in the image and likeness of God. God has free will. And so he doesn't make you do anything. He gives you the ability to create your own process of ascension, your own church of one, your own guiding star, your own North Star. So it's really up to each individual person. And nobody's coming to save you, per se, except the spiritual world. But if you looked at the face of the devil and you didn't quickly turn and go the opposite direction, then that's your fate. Yeah, so that's where the, a person like the, in that situation uh, really has to confess their sin. Absolutely. And, and that uh, turning around uh, this um, redemption process is is what it's all about. And you could even say, instead of looking down, looking up, even though it's not literally true, uh, and instead of looking out, looking in, and then what do you get? You find yourself alone with the same thing Moses felt, the still, quiet voice. Mm -hmm. And then once you start in the path, you are looking at the burning bush. You're looking at your heart turn, turn into a flame that will become a sun. And what does the sun do? It shines equally on good and evil. The sun is not discriminatory. And you shouldn't be either if you're going to be a spiritual person. But let's say you encounter a, a demonically possessed person. You probably can't help them much unless you are trained in that. So as you say, tip your hat and go to the other side of the street. Now, when we get in these conversations, uh, time seems to stand still. And I look up and it's, you know, 55 minutes into the talk. And I thought we oh, just started. Is. So oh, wow. we're, 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 we're a little bit over. But um, we've been talking about the fact that uh, sometimes these conversations, we just get rolling at about an hour. So I decided to keep this one a little bit longer. But we're going to continue these conversations because so many people are so appreciative of it. And it's a deep dive into the things that we're doing in the other interviews with an exorcist podcast. So Michael, I want to thank you for all those people out there who literally some of them say, you know, they truly love you and they really, you know, they think you're so wonderful. So we I want to continue this. Prayers. I know. And that's what I say to them. And someone said that, you know, many people say that we're praying for you guys. We're praying for you and Michael and John and Tyla that you continue your work because it's opening up new worlds. But what we, anytime that you're going to get wisdom from anything we're saying, you are remembering it. It isn't new. And so if you're hearing us and it sounds as if it's something that has been in your heart for a long time, then it may be the truth. And that's all you really need to know is that you literally find sources that inspire you, whether it's reading a beautiful book, singing, uh, reciting a psalm, uh, singing a, a beautiful religious song, 
writing a poem to God or to love anyone you love, that's writing to God. So all of these things are the path for individuals and no two people have the same path. And I think it's marvelous that so many people are telling us that this awakens in them the remembrances that they have of these truths. So I thank you again, and we'll do another one of these podcasts soon. And I'm sure Great. that um, uh, Stump the Exorcist questions that you bring are, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. they're really appreciated by people. They're really appreciated by me because sometimes I forget to explain the elementary things, the things that are the foundational, not, I didn't mean elementary in an insulting way, but the yeah. foundational things and to go back and not to use terminology or jargon and that's what you love to do is say, now, hold it. Well, what do you mean by that? I'm a, I'm an engineer. So if you're going to say we have 12 senses, you need to name them. Name them. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then I'll check to see if I have those senses. And then, <laughs> and that's what you need to do. That is the spirit of discernment that is one of the most important things for our age. So thank you again, Michael. I always love having these conversations with you. And I'm glad that they're not just you and I on the phone, uh, which we've been doing for five or six years now, or however long it's been but that they are something that can be shared with others and might be of some help and use to them. So thank you to our listeners. Thank you for encouraging us to continue these things. Thank you for your prayers. And Michael, thank you for your insight and the warmth and wisdom that you always share with us when we're on broadcasts. Well, you're welcome. <laughs>